You're listening to The Secret to My Success, an interview style podcast that asks our guests what trait, skill, or characteristic they possess that's made them a success. Hosted by Shelby Skirhawk. I've been accused of not feeling my feelings. Really? It's an interesting uh, concept because for me, I would have never have noticed that until it had been pointed out to me. But, but think about the, the premise there that when you're feeling uncomfortable or you're feeling um, sad or uh-huh. angry or confused or, or overwhelmed, um, what's your tendency to, to deal with those? Are you trying to work through that? Or are you trying to get past it as quickly as possible? Mm, if I'm honest, I'm going to get past it as quickly as possible yeah, person. And I think most people are. They know that it's important to, to feel what you're feeling. But understanding really how to do that is something that I don't think a whole lot of people know how to do. No. I, I mean, the, the feeling of um, uncomfortable, uh, being uncomfortable, um, about having a difficult conversation, for example. Mm. I mean, that's something that a lot of people, I mean, they will do anything to avoid conflict. Oh, heck yeah. And so being able to, to navigate something like a difficult conversation, <laughs> you know, usually you're just trying to get the thing over with and done with. Um, but there are certain strategies to, to, um, to feeling your feelings. And that's something that our guest today, Peter Bregman, talks about. His new book, which came out July 11th, is Leading with Emotional Courage, How to Have Hard Conversations, Create Accountability, and Inspire Action on Your Most Important Work. So something Hmm. that Peter says often is that if you're willing to feel everything, you can experience anything. So this is an interesting idea because like we just talked about, you really don't want to feel this this discomfort of sitting down to um, to to fire somebody, or no having a a difficult conversation about um, you know maybe with a friend who has disappointed you somehow, and then oh, yeah. and there's that that um, that point at which you probably need to look at moving on. Like all of those situations are are things that most of us will do anything to avoid at yeah. all costs yes exactly and so um but the the premise that that peter says is that that discomfort that we that we have uh, and trying to avoid it is exactly what keeps us from acting most powerfully in our lives hmm. so you've heard the concept that um, whatever scares you is probably the thing that you need to do most oh yeah so sure. this is this is pulling on the same idea that what you are what's what your stomach is churning about right now that you know that you need to do but you don't want to is probably the thing that you really need to tackle. Well, I know that, <laughs> but that doesn't mean I'm gonna do it. Exactly. So so Peter gives some um, some tips for um, how to, for example, ask for honest feedback. Mm. That's something that when you know you're in a working environment. Um, and something just doesn't seem to be working right and and you don't want to open yourself up to that vulnerability but obviously something's not happening you're not advancing like you want to and so maybe it's time to ask for that honest feedback Mm -hmm. or he gives tips for better listening uh, being able to listen to somebody's discomfort and um, the the example that comes to mind is uh, when somebody's in mourning or grieving Mm. you know if you are not if you're not in that situation or if you've never been in that situation previously, it is, mm-hmm. it's tremendously difficult to know what to say to somebody that's, that's hurting that much. Oh yeah. And so oftentimes, the, you know, it's kind of the, the, the pat on the back and then, okay, well, let me know if you need, you need anything. anything. That's the most disingenuous part of it though, because they don't know what they need. Like no. the, the, that's, that's where you need to make yourself emotionally vulnerable um, to, to open up them so that way they can open up to you. Hmm. Um, and, you know, and also he talks about why uh, kindness is the cure for a bad mood. 
So, uh, well, that's true because you hear all that, you know, like, what is it? Um, if you smile, every, smile is literally contagious. Literally, I'm not just saying that. It's it is it's proven in science. And then like the whole idea of you know one kind act, like paying for somebody else's coffee that un, you know they weren't expecting it, will completely change their day and carry fo- and pay it forward. Right, right. So this concept of, of kindness, then. Um, one thing he says in the book that I loved was um, basically why you should treat others with with kindness. And basically it's because remember that everyone you meet is fighting a hard battle. Mm-hmm. You just don't know it. And, and that's that's a great way of, of kind of um, soliciting empathy for, for people that you don't know because you do realize that everybody's got their own struggles. Mm-hmm. And so the best thing that you can do just as a decent human being is just just give them the benefit of the doubt to, to be kind to others and that is very contagious he mm-hmm. likens emotions to a common cold and so huh. when you're in a bad mood you that's it that's very contagious and so it's it spreads very easily for people around you uh-huh. but the thing is is that so then when you have a cold do you go sneezing on other people no no but when you're in a bad mood that's what you're doing you're basically yeah. just sneezing over everybody and 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 spreading your bad mood to others hmm. and so this this idea of then realizing again everybody's going through their own struggles mm-hmm. so me being in a foul mood and projecting that outward does nobody good and so nope. it, it, it that I guess that was a, a real eye opener for me, and something that I loved. Um, I loved from from Peter's book. But uh, so he's going to talk about um, leading with emotional courage, what emotional courage is, and why it isn't emotional intelligence. So thank you for joining me, Peter. It's my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. So I, I want to start off with by defining what you mean by emotional and emotional courage and why it's so important in our lives. You know, you, you define it actually really nicely in the introduction. And, you know, emotional courage is the willingness to feel things. And if you are willing to feel everything, you can do anything. And, and what I mean by that is think about a hard conversation that you haven't had. So a conversation that's hard, that you want to have, that you've been thinking about having, but for some reason you've procrastinated on it and you haven't had it. And consider why you haven't had it, right? And and I'm willing to bet you know exactly what you want to say. I'm willing to bet you've had opportunities to say it, or you could have created opportunities to say it. And I'm willing to bet that you have enough skills to be able to raise the issue and have the conversation. So then the question is, why not do it? And the reason is I'm also willing to bet that there's something you don't want to feel, right? So, you know, if I have a hard conversation with someone, I risk feeling disconnected. I risk feeling their anger. I risk feeling my own anger. I risk feeling frustration or defensiveness, either my own or someone else's. And so if I'm willing to feel all of those things, if I'm not afraid of it, or if I am afraid of it, but I'm willing to feel the fear of it and still have those uh, conversations and feel anything that might come at me in relation to any emotion I might be afraid of, if I'm willing to feel it all, then nothing stops me from having the conversation. I know what I need to know. I have opportunity. I have enough skill. I can do it. And the more I studied this and the more I looked at it and practiced it and played with it, I noticed that emotional courage was underlying everything that we do that the the gap that I have spent my life trying to help people close, and I do it in, in our work at Bregman Partners, and I do it individually, is to close the gap between what we know and what we do. I generally think there's a huge gap between common sense and everybody's doing it. Yeah, And we all know enough to be very productive and effective in our lives. We don't fail or struggle for lack of knowledge. We fail or struggle for lack of follow through right? The challenging issue is closing the gap between what we know and what we do. And so that's the problem I'm most interested in helping people close. And I've done it with each of my books and leading with emotional courage actually feels like my most important book at this point, because it's it's really like everything that I know about, here's what gets in people's way 
when they're trying to follow through on what's most important to them. And, you know, with 18 minutes, my book on time management, I was really looking at how we, how we manage time. And I think that work is very, very important. Underlying that though, is even if I have something in my calendar, am I following through on it? If I really want to write, am I sitting down and writing or am I getting up and going to the fridge 10 times and <laughs> emails and, you know, doing any number of small tasks, cleaning up my, my wife used to love it when I had a proposal to write, uh, because, uh, you know, it would be two days and the entire apartment would get really clean and I'd be <laughs> cooking dinner and I'd yes. be doing like all these things other than writing the proposal because there was something very scary about it for me. Like I might fail. I'm a perfectionist and, you know, perfection in order to do something productive you're going to give to a client that might represent a sale or not was scary for me. I really wanted to get it right. This was a first impression in many cases. And so given the fear of that, given the insecurity of it, given the ambiguity of the situation, I would rather do something that made me feel good as opposed to might bring up these other feelings of, you know, insecurity, et cetera. And so, so, uh, you know, that, that's what gets in our way. It's incredibly concrete, though never talked about really. What gets in our way of taking bold action is what we're willing to feel. And if we are willing to feel everything, if we're willing to have emotional courage, Right, the courage to feel things, and they are physical feelings. You can feel emotions in your body. If you're willing to feel everything, you could do anything. But that feeling is certainly a, an uncomfortable um, sensation, uh, especially if you're dealing with, you know, asking for for feedback from somebody or or having a difficult conversation that you've been putting off that you don't want to have, and 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 that's been kind of stewing inside. Uh, literally, you can feel that because it's probably stewing right there in your gut. Uh, why do, I guess it's sort of an obvious question, but I mean, why are we so afraid of our feelings? It's it's actually a great question. Is It's a great question. And I, I think, you know, feelings are energy in your body, right? It's actually energy building up in your body. And we're not used to talking about them, I think, but depending upon our culture, uh, we're, we're not even really taught to experience them. This is, this is stuff that we're not taught to do. When I look at what happens in, in schooling, I look at my, I have three kids and I look at what my kids are learning or what I look at, I learned. No one's teaching them how to feel things or what it feels like to feel things or even what these feelings are. We, we spend all of our energy in the mm -hmm. head. And actually, if you look at the difference between what I'm trying to talk about here around emotional courage and what people have talked a lot about over the last couple of decades, which is emotional right. intelligence, um, the, the weight and the strength of the conversation around emotional intelligence is on the second part, not the first part, right? It's on the intelligence part and much less on the emotional part. There are very few conversations that are as intellectual as the one that happens around emotional intelligence. And we talk about emotions as opposed to experiencing emotions. And we all know everything we need to know about emotions. We can understand how they work. We can understand them. Yes, some people are more savvy about understanding emotions than others, but the problem or the challenge isn't that we don't know enough about emotions, but it's that we're uncomfortable feeling them because we've never really been taught how, and yet we naturally have them. And our emotions often make other people right. uncomfortable, right? So that's underlying the reason why we're so uncomfortable with them is because if I showed anger as a kid or you showed anger as a kid, that was probably shut down pretty fast by your caregiver because it made them uncomfortable. If you were sad, it probably made you know your caregivers uncomfortable. And so they didn't want you to be sad. They wanted you to be happy. So they discouraged your feeling of sadness. Sadness became right. not a good thing. Happiness, a good thing. Anger, not a good thing. Happiness, joyful, easy to get along with, good thing. And so we became comfortable with certain emotions and we became unidimensional. We became people who are really comfortable expressing, you know, the the what we consider to be positive emotions and not expressing the negative emotions. And the problem with that is that all of these emotions are supernatural, are super comma natural, not supernatural. <laughs> they're, they're, they're like very natural. And 
and and they are necessary. It is necessary to feel the emotions. And I think because we're afraid of them, we allow them to take over as though they own us. And so that anger becomes such a huge uh, thing. It's, it's, you know, when in English, even the language is such that we don't say, I have anger, like you say in other mm-hmm. languages, but you say, I am angry. I am angry. And one of the pieces of work that we do when I'm teaching people how to increase their emotional courage is to help them create some separation between the emotion and themselves. So one of the things that I'll often ask in our programs is, okay, so you're feeling something, right? You're feeling angry or sad or whatever you're feeling. What are you feeling and where are you feeling it? Where are you feeling it in your chest? Are you feeling it in your stomach? What part of your stomach? And people are not used to locating their emotions, but they are physical sensations and a physical sensation is felt somewhere right? You can locate a physical sensation. And when they begin to say, wow, I'm angry. and Where do I feel it? I feel it in my, you mentioned gut, like I feel it in my gut on the left side of my gut. Then I can say, great, feel it. Because if you're not willing to feel it, you're going to act out of that anger. You're going to yell, you're going to do something that is going to let off the steam. When we say blow off steam, we're literally doing that. We're blowing off steam. And the anger is energy in my body somewhere. And it, if it feels untenable, I'm going to have to release it some way. And I'm going to do it in probably the safest way possible, which will come out sideways in a passive aggressive manner or something so that I don't have to be held responsible for it. And this explains 90% of the problems that we face yeah. in our world today. And if we were more willing to feel these things and own them and go, yeah, I'm feeling it. It's in my left side. I'm feeling really angry. Now, what is it telling me? What am I learning from it? What It's telling me that there's maybe a disconnect between my values and what's happening right now. What's that disconnect? How do I change it? How do I step in and do something effective that will bring me back in line? We're not overwhelmed by the emotion or by the anger, but it informs us. And then we're courageous enough both to feel it and then also to take the action that will help us productively move in the direction that we want to move in. All of that requires that we be okay feeling things. But if I'm not okay feeling the anger, I'm not going to be able to use it as data because I'm not going to be able to distinguish myself Mm -hmm. from the feeling. And if I'm not courageous enough about what I'm willing to feel, then I probably won't speak up in the meeting and say, hey, you guys aren't being respectful in the way you're talking and it's it's making this meeting very unproductive. That's a very scary thing to say in a meeting. If I'm willing to feel everything, I'm going to be able to say that and I'm going to be able to turn that meeting around. When you mentioned um, quashing some of the feelings, some of the the feelings we have as 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 children, you know, an angry outburst or or um, this specific example of discouraging sadness, that of course reminds me of the uh, Pixar film Inside Out. So I'm curious uh, what your take on that is, and and. I guess what the lesson is in terms of emotions and how it pertains to emotional courage. I love that film. I thought it was really fun. And it, it, what I, one of the things that I really loved about it is you really got a dramatization of this fact that emotions can take over. I mean, I saw myself reflected at various times in that movie and like emotions can, can really take over. And when you realize that you don't have to let go of the wheel. Right. And, and this is not by the way, you know, we're, we're talking about this around these big emotions, but there are very subtle emotions that prevent us from moving forward. Ultimately, what I'm writing about in Leading with Emotional Courage is how do you move forward in the things that are most important to you? The subtitle is how to have hard conversations, create accountability, and inspire action on your most important work. How do we move forward on what we care most about? In one form or other, all of the work that I do in, in at Bregman Partners and what I write about is how do I help people do what's most important to them? I don't tell people what's most important to them, but I do help them with the tools that will help them follow through on that and get there. And we often procrastinate on what's most important to us. And the reason is because if we don't want to feel something, then we're not going to take the actions that might bring on those feelings. So if I don't want to feel my vulnerability, then I probably won't take my greatest ideas and put it in a book and then put it out there for everybody to look at and possibly criticize, right? That's going to, that's a very scary thing to do. Like this is very dear and near to my heart and other people might say, Hey, this is stupid. So if I, if I allow myself to not feel, if I, if I don't allow myself to feel the possibility that I might have that kind of pushback, 
well, then I'll never come out and write the book. And then I won't follow through on what's most important to me. So there's the one hand, and I think what the movie did really nicely was to say, hey, these emotions like sadness or anxiety or, or fear or anger, those things are very real and they happen in us and they're you know happening in our heads and and in our bodies actually which i think is most important it's like really happening in our bodies and um we might lose control of ourselves when uh if we don't really understand that and separate ourselves from it enough and be willing to feel it almost more importantly because i think the issue of people you know yelling and losing themselves in their emotions is very very real in terms of getting your most important work done, it's not the thing that gets in the way the most. I think the thing that gets in the way in the most is what do I have to be willing to feel in order to act strategically and intentionally to move forward on what's most important? And that means I might have to feel someone else's anger. I might have to feel someone else's uh, disbelief, right? Mm -hmm. That someone's, you know, a, a, a disappointment. Uh, am I willing to disappoint someone else in order to not disappoint myself? And can I do it skillfully where I don't write them off right. because I don't want to feel their disappointment? I mean, those are the skills that really make us successful in the world, right? And those are the skills that we don't teach in schools. Yeah. And and th that's not really even part of the conversation in of of emotional intelligence, and that's what I'm bringing in in leading with emotional courage. Absolutely, and and because like you said, you know, just just the idea of putting yourself out there. I mean, and we can use the example of asking for honest feedback. Um, in the book, you you talk about how um, how being able to solicit honest feedback. I mean, that is a very, um, a very scary proposition. I mean, it leaves you feeling very vulnerable asking for it. And then, I mean, it, I think it's a human tendency then to feel a little bit insecure after receiving it. So in the process of asking for feedback, what are the steps to, to, to best receive that? And then also, I want to understand the connection between feedback and confidence, because that's something that you mentioned in the book that I found interesting. Sure. So I, I break the book up into four parts, which are the four elements of leadership. And when I say leadership, by the way, I don't mean just, you know, the senior most leaders of the largest organizations. Uh, the leadership to me is taking ambitious action in your life. You could have, you know, 10,000 people reporting to you or no one reporting to you. But if you're willing to lead, it's sort of the double entendre of leading with emotional courage. It's if you're willing to start with emotional courage, you can move right. forward and get anything done that you want to. And, and the book is broken up into these four sections, which is confidence in yourself, connection to others, commitment to purpose, and emotional courage. And these are the four elements of being able to act powerfully in the world, right? You need to really be grounded in yourself. You need to be connected to other people. And you need to be committed to something bigger than all of you. And the emotional courage is both necessary and grows with those other three. And, and by the way, we all know people who have some and not all of those. And you really need all four of those together. So people who are confident in themselves... And I don't mean mm -hmm. a false confidence. I don't mean arrogance or you know insecurity driven. I am better than you. Um, that's not confidence. Confidence is I'm willing to be wrong. Confidence is I don't lose a sense of myself. I'm connected to myself. I know what I'm feeling at any point in time. I'm grounded in what I care about. I'm willing to disappoint another in order to not disappoint myself. That that's that's the true confidence that I'm talking about. We all know people who are confident like that, but are totally disconnected right. from the people around them, and. We also know people who are connected to the people around them, but will give themselves up in order to make the people around them happy, right? And, and yeah. to make everything comfortable around them. And we know people who, are, who don't either have confidence in themselves or connected to others, but they just pursue a purpose with such abandon that they leave themselves and everybody else behind. And so to be really powerful in the world, you mm -hmm. need all three of these and uh, with a healthy dose of the fourth, which is emotional courage. So when you, what you're asking about specifically is giving feedback and, and, and asking for feedback. And one of the reasons to ask for feedback is, first of all, it, it's, a, it's a great exercise in emotional courage, right? Because right. you're asking someone, what do you think about me? And you're, you have to do it in a way that never makes them wrong, that um, actually encourages them to give you real information, that um, informs you about yourself and maybe a little bit about them as well. 
and that um, leaves them feeling better and you feeling more knowledgeable and better also if you can. So it's, it's, a, it's one of those things that, by the way, takes yeah. confidence in yourself and builds confidence in yourself, right? Because if you're not willing to see yourself from the angles that other people see, if you're not willing to see yourself the way other people see you, then your, your sense of groundedness is going to be very thin, right? You're going to lose your ground very, very quickly because it means that you have an image of yourself that's very, very necessary to hold firm to in order for you to feel okay. And that's not a deep confidence in yourself. Like deep confidence in yourself says, I see myself in a certain way. Huh, they see me differently. I wonder what I might be missing, right? I wonder where my blind spots are. By definition, the only way we can see blind spots is if someone else tells us. Right, right. Because we're blind to them. We definitionally can't see them. And so if I'm not willing to look at my blind spots, that exposes a weakness in my confidence, in my real willingness to go. Even if someone points out things about me that they don't like, and maybe even that I don't like, that's okay. I can handle it. I'm okay. And so listening to it actually builds that kind of self-confidence. It also requires some self-confidence to get yeah. yourself to a point where you can listen to it. So, and you asked for some steps. So here's, here's a few steps. Um, one is when you're talking to someone, be clear that you want honest feedback, right? So just be clear that you don't right. need them to just say nice things, that you want to learn about how you're seen, that you have some blind spots and you want to know what they are. Um, I, I think it's easier if you ask those questions in a future-oriented way than a past. So instead of saying, tell me what I've done well or poorly in the last month, you could say, Give me some advice about how I can be more effective in the future, either by continuing to do mm -hmm. things I'm doing that are working or doing less of something or something differently than I've been doing in the past. So what would be, how could I be more helpful and powerful and productive and useful and valuable in our relationship? So you're looking at a future, which is easier to talk about, both in terms of people giving you the feedback and in terms of you receiving it, than talking about the past, which might just feel like you're getting beat up. Right, or more defensive even. Or more defensive, exactly. You can get very defensive about what you did and you can start – it's exactly right, Shelby. You could, ex you could start to explain it uh -huh. away or you don't really understand that situation and that gets in your way. Um, the Another step is to probe, to ask questions, to be curious. Curiosity is this – uh, it's a curiosity these days is one of my favorite uh, modes of being mm. like the, you learn so much when you continue to be open and curious and ask questions. And then most importantly, listen without judgment. Your job is not to quantify, qualify it, not to explain away, not to make sure they see you the way you see yourself. You're just asking for feedback in order to see yourself the way they see you um, and, and to really learn from that. And what I would also say is, it's very helpful to write what they say down because as you're writing down, it'll stop you from getting too defensive. It'll reflect to them that you care about what they're saying and you'll be able to go back to it and remember what they've said in case there were things that were interesting right. that you kind of got a little defensive about or something like that. So those are some of the steps that can help you do it and you need confidence to do it and you'll build your confidence by doing it. Another um, another situation that you talk about in the book is, um, like the the subtitle suggests, is as having a difficult conversation that that you're dreading. So um, in the book, you say that the more you fear a conversation, the more you probably need to have it. Think of fear as an indicator of a problem that needs to be addressed. So first, explain that a little bit, and then how do you how do you get yourself to that position where you're ready to to engage in that conversation. Yeah, it's interesting because you know if there is a conversation that you're dreading or you are afraid, um, it, it's it is a great sign that it's a conversation you need to have, right? And um, and you're going to feel a lot of things because you're you know you're the premise of the conversation is that you're dreading it. Like it's something I I don't really want to talk about, but but it's not getting out of my head. And I'm, I'm still sitting with it. So there's some things you dread that just go away and you don't have to worry about it. And you could just kind of let it go. You don't have to address everything. Mm -hmm. But here's a situation where it's a hard conversation. You really need to have it. And the first thing to do is to notice what's hard about it. Like maybe notice, ask yourself the question, what am I afraid mm -hmm. of? Right? What what's the fear that I'm feeling? Am I afraid of their disconnection? Am I afraid of shame? Am I afraid of them lashing back at me? I'm afraid of myself lashing at them, like, what am I afraid of? So I could just sort of, you know, label it, be aware of it, et cetera. And, 
And, you know, I mean, I guess even before then, you have to notice that you are dreading a conversation, like just noticing that you're procrastinating on doing something, on having a hard conversation. And it's because you're feeling something that you don't want to feel. Once you feel it, and once you're willing to feel it, then the next question is, what is the underlying problem that it's signaling, right? So if you have to have a hard conversation, it's probably because there's some disconnect that's happening in your life and your work between you and someone else. Understand what that problem is. And here's where I, I want to caution people to not make a mistake that I often hear people make or watch people make, which is just because you're becoming very familiar with your feelings and you're not letting them get in the mm -hmm. way anymore, doesn't mean you have to talk mm -hmm. about them. So in a conversation that you dread or that's a difficult conversation, I wouldn't necessarily, I'm not saying you can't do this, but I wouldn't necessarily go to them and go, hey, I've been very afraid of this yeah. conversation because I think you might get really angry. I mean, you could do that. It might even be a strategy for for you know, making it easier to be in the conversation. But the issue that you really want to talk about is what's driving is the problem that's underneath the dread. So you know, maybe the problem is they're not showing up on time to your meetings, or maybe the problem is you, know, you feel like they're undercutting your authority, or I don't know what the problem might be, but whatever the problem is, talk about the problem. The dread is yours to, to breathe through and move. When you're talking about them, talk about the problem and address the problem. And a lot of people, if you're not willing to feel your emotions, you might end up talking about the problem, but it will be so laced right. with the emotion that it will prompt anger and defensiveness and have it go wrong. But if you're willing to feel it, then you can disentangle the emotion from the conversation and then you can have the conversation. Which, And I'm not suggesting repressing the emotion. Feel it. Just don't let gotcha. it control you. Well, and so something that I recognized um, in in – reading that chapter. Um, and again, it comes back to this knowledge action gap is that you say lead with or start with the punchline, make the, the very most important conclusion in your very first sentence. And you go on to explain that too often conversations back into into what the issue is. And I was like, that's me. I do that all the time. I go explaining everything before I say what I actually needed to say. So I think that's a, that's a, um, a, a powerful lesson then in, in having that conversation. So again, you're saying start with the punchline, what the most important thing is, say that first, right? Yeah, I think that's so important. And here's what I see, especially when someone has a difficult conversation that they want to have with someone or something that, you know, it's even a conversation about firing somebody or that, that you, that, that if we're uncomfortable with it, we delay getting to that punchline. And I've seen situations where it could be like 30 <laughs> minutes until they say the thing that they really need to say. And everything else is couching it and giving context. And meanwhile, the person yeah. knows something's up and they're yeah. they're sitting there scratching their head going, uh, you know, I mean, I've made this mistake myself where the person says, I, I don't know, Peter, if you're <laughs> firing me right. or promoting me, like it's very hard for me to tell. Right? And, and, and I realize like my own discomfort with it is – is and is prolonging and what it's prolonging is the agony because until i actually say the punchline am i promoting the person or or firing them i'm going to feel all of those feelings and and i'm i'm trying to hold myself from feeling the really big bomb one but the funny thing is i'm still going to have to feel that and if i feel that up front then all the other feelings begin to dissipate in terms of their intensity and it's much easier for me to have a, a sort of productive, supportive conversation because I'm not holding this other piece and then we can really get to my holding them right. if that's what I need to do or my, you know, being clear about what it is that, you know, why I've come to that decision. We're reducing the ambiguity in the conversation Absolutely. and that helps a lot. So um, I think the most important takeaway that I got from the book was uh, your metaphor comparing emotions to the common cold. So will you share that, uh, that metaphor and then what it means? Sure. You know, emotions are contagious. We know from research that um, moods are contagious. If you walk into a room and you feel, you know, this negative vibe or negative mood, then, you know, you soon will to start to feel negative and you'll actually even perpetuate it. Same thing with a positive mood, that your emotions are contagious and and to realize, just like a common cold. And when you think about a common cold, you wouldn't walk around your house or the office or 
you know, anywhere, just sneezing yes. all over people, you know, like everybody would look at you and say like, hey, <laughs> hey, 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 don't get me sick. But they're not walking around going, hey, don't get me complaining or don't get me angry or don't get me sad. Like they're, they're, if, if we're unconscious of it, we end up spilling all over everybody and, and, and our moods literally infect the people who are around us. So if you're aware of it, you could avoid that because you're aware of it. You don't have to express everything. I mean, it's one of the things that people talk about. They say, you know, are you telling me that I should be really emotional all the time? And I'm saying it's, it, you know, it's funnily enough, you know, yes and no. On the one hand, if what you mean by emotional is feel my emotions, I would say absolutely. If what you mean by emotional is express my emotions all the time, mm. I would say no. In fact, the more you're willing to feel these emotions, the less yeah. you have a need to express it. You can choose to express it, but you don't have a need to. So that we become much more responsible and 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 strategic, actually, about how we end up expressing ourselves because we're not taken over by the emotions. Right. Well, and I like the the um, kind of reality check that that you say. Well, one, the sneezing. Uh, that's that's such a powerful um, visualization because you're right. When you're sick, you don't go sneezing on other people. So even though with emotions, you can blame your mood, your bad mood, on someone else. Uh, you say you're still responsible for what you pass to others, and I think that is that's that's a very important point that I really want to underscore. Um, but back to what I was saying before about um, you have a reality check there. So when you're feeling those those um, that common cold of of feelings, you're saying it's not just as easy though as you know. Well, I'm just going to decide not to feel that way. Like like you have a a, a good realistic view of it, saying that it's um, it's it's hard and and probably inauthentic or or even dishonest to feign happiness. What do you mean by that? Yeah, I mean, and and here's what I think is really interesting about that is that the more, and I talk about this in leading with emotional courage, the the more you're you don't lose yourself in the context of your feelings. Not only do you not spread the disease, right, but you're inoculated from it. It's like a vaccination, right? Which is that if I if I'm really aware of what I'm feeling, then I walk in a room and go, oof, it feels sad here, you know, and like I or I or there's a lot of negativity and people are angry and you can feel it such that you don't fall prey to it. Like you have some control over what emotions you fall prey to or not, because you, you don't have to own what's not yours, mm -hmm. right? You own what's yours. And on the other hand, if you're not aware of it, then like the common cold, it's kind of impossible not to catch. I mean, that's what the research shows that, you know, if someone in a bad mood walks into a room and, and by the way, negative emotions have more contagious strength they're more um, they're more infectious than positive emotions. Really? But if if you you know if someone walks in with a bad mood, chances are you're going to start to feel that. And and I you know when when you're willing to feel everything, you don't necessarily have to express it. You don't dump it on other people, and you also don't take what doesn't belong to you mm. in the same way. So it inoculates you from this kind of infection that um, gives you again tremendous power to act in integrity with yourself. So you're not saying that if you're affected by someone else's mood, the solution is not, well, I've, I, I've caught their mood and now I just need to, to make myself, you know, uh, make myself happy. No, the, the, the solution is realizing it, realizing that, that that person has that bad mood that is infectious. And so if you're able to identify it, then you're saying you can inoculate yourself to it, right? Yeah, and 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 I, I I never say make yourself feel something. Like I'm not a fan of of making yourself feel something, yeah. and and because I, I I think that's not real. That's not natural. I want actually people to be real and natural, and and yet you know we. Um, but I also don't want you to own feelings that don't belong to you. I mean, I think we all have patterns. We all sort of get stuck in certain kinds of feelings because they're comfortable to us. Because there are go-to feelings, you know, like uh, you learn as a kid, if you walk around sad, people pay attention to you. So you start acting sad, mm -hmm. even if you're not sad. Yeah. And so I think it's like where there's sort of a process of normalization that happens where you can actually begin to really feel the feelings that you're having without being overwhelmed by them and also without taking on stuff that doesn't belong to you.
Excellent points, Peter. Thank you so much. I think um, a lot of listeners will will take away some key vil- visualizations there and be able to to better identify their moods and uh, and have the courage then to feel them. So thanks so much. It's such a pleasure. Thanks for taking an interest in it. Okay, so. <laughs> This is so funny. They put this stuff in kids' books, too. Did yeah. you know that? So there's a ki- this that we're talking about right now. Um, or, I guess, talking about the contagious yeah. thing. Yeah. Uh, night before last, Rose pulled out one of her books, and it's got, like, you know, five-minute short stories in it. And one of the stories is about a monkey who wakes up all happy, having a good day, and then um, a fly lands on his nose, and mm-hmm. he starts to frown, and the parrot sees him frown. And the parrot's oh. like, why are you frowning? And he goes, I don't know, a fly landed on my nose. And the parrot starts frowning and goes and talks to the elephant, and the elephant oh. starts frowning, and then the lion cub starts frowning, and then the lion starts frowning, and yeah. then the monkey comes up, because he was just frowning for one second because right. of this fly on his nose, and then the monkey comes up, to this group of frowning sad animals yeah. and is like why is everybody frowning and they're like well you started and he's like what yeah he didn't even it's realize like, it they're like well why were you frowning because there was a fly on my nose and then of course the lion cub starts giggling <laughs> and thinks it's funny and then nobody else can stop giggling right so, so it's just like, like it's contagious yeah, yeah that's just contagious cute. and that's a kid's and that's a kid's story that's smart that's smart it's it, but they don't get the connection right <laughs> Of course, I didn't get the connection until just now. Right, right. 